Hey Paul, how are you doing? Hi, I'm very well. I'm glad to be here. Now the question, uh, is Paul actually pronounced perfectly or is it Paul or how to... S Paul, like, as in Paul McCartney, but not as famous and I don't, not very good at music. Yeah, Paul McCartney, yeah, of course, uh, Beatles, of course. Yeah. Uh, and you like uh, Paul, Paul McCartney better or Beatles or Rolling Stones? There are two camps, as oh, far as I know. That is, uh, I actually like them both, but I, I think over time the, um, the Beatles may last longer than the Stones, although the Stones right now are lasting longer. <laughs> yeah. They, they got a new album out. I haven't heard it. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, oh, just, this is interesting. So I will have to listen because it's always interesting. No? And it seems like the st Stones still have fun. You know, This is what, what I really appreciate. So that's probably why they're still alive, amazingly so. Especially uh, Keith Richards. That's yeah. The, 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 the pirate, right? Yes. Now, the most, imp um, the most important question of the show is, what was your first computer? It was a BBC Micro. Oh, this is a very common one, actually. Not very, I would say, 30% of, of my guests have the BBC uh, Micro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a big push through government and the, uh, the BBC organization to make these available. Uh, mm -hmm. But they were more expensive than the other computers were, but mm -hmm. a little bit more bigger and robust. What was fascinating for me with these computers, what came out of that was ARM from the same company. Uh, Just second, I didn't know about that. Yeah, my okay. second computer was an, Ar an Archimedes. Uh -huh. And that had an ARM processor in it, a 32-bit mm -hmm. processor with four megabytes of memory. Well, at the time, was outstanding. And so, I never heard about Archimedes, actually. Yeah. So that was Is, where, where from that came, from that, I believe, came the ARM uh, company. Okay. So. Uh, and is it, um, what you, maybe, what you did with the BBC, you, you started playing or, you know, programming or... Working um, on the JVM already, or what was actually no, your mission? No, no, no. JVM was that was before then. Um, so I think you know a, there was a, a sort of growing community of people who would have computers and they would swap games. Okay. And that's how it started. My dad was in computers, so he brought computers at home, so they were a natural part of our environment. And so I was curious about them, and I, I think I started by getting magazines and then typing. The, the games in you mm -hmm. know, laboriously showing my mm -hmm. age now typing the, typing the hexadecimal numbers in and playing games and then it started. hexadecimal numbers because uh, I did it the same with basic I had yes. to type in all the basic code yes yeah you could type in basic but these these games were written in, a, in machine code and so you oh. get them at the back of magazines and you'd, you'd type them in, in machine code with a bit of wrap around basic to sort of execute it and I so never saw did. that so I had that set spectrum in my magazines. We always had to know the basic listings. Yeah, later on it would be like that, but in the early days it would be very uh, laborious. Oh. So um, we would do that, but then you'd get interested. Then, then programming would start, and you'd program in basic because that was the most accessible uh, way to do it, and just, just self-taught learning. And why you started to program and not keep, keep playing games? Because uh, it was fun. Okay. It's interesting to understand how the computer worked. Yeah, sure. But, you know, as a kid, I mean, everything is interesting, but I mean, yes. not I, everyone I, programs, you know. That's very true. Um, I guess because my dad did it. I okay. was curious what he did. Uh, also, other people were doing it. Friends were doing it too. So in the peer group, they were playing around on other kinds of computers and were exploring it. And so you sort of get into it slowly like that. And before you know it, But what was cool these days, you remember? What do you, your peers did? Like, I don't know, I today I managed to do something and um, you saw, okay, uh, th that's cool. And then I would try to do the same. So what was actually so the coolness factor back then? It would be someone hacking a game to okay. get lives. Oh, okay. Stuff like that. So there's knowledge of how the, the games are okay. constructed or the, uh, the assembler works. So you, you gradually through magazines read and understand uh, the process by that. And then you could write your own games or you could uh, write your own little stuff to prove a, a point in school like you could then you could you could sort of simulate physics mm -hmm. so if you were learning about gravity and physics you could simulate physics and so you could simulate a bouncing ball jumping around and and, 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 and that was fun and you could visually you could connect it to a visual mm -hmm. uh, the visual aspect of the graphics so that was a lot of fun with that. yeah it sounds fun to me but for kids Not always, right? Because if you do something for school, it's not always fun, you know? This oh, is no, like, it has to, to be... Yes. 
you have to make okay. it. And it wasn't. It wasn't just that computers were the only thing. They were just part of the thing you would do, and you'd play a lot of games. You'd fiddle around with it. Okay. And, and that's so, and you'd be outside playing football too. So you did a mixture of stuff. So they they were fascinating devices. And I think just because my father was involved in them, um, I, I, I got more involved in that. And, and then my peers mm-hmm. in school were involved, so they just played around. What was your favorite game on the uh, BBC? Elite. I know, I knew about Elite. What, what was Elite? Elite was a space adventure game. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. um, I can't remember the names of the authors now, but they were very much involved in the BBC Micro and then the... Archimedes in, in writing games, but to, to write a game like that with this 3D wireframe graphics and to encode the sort of the worlds and the gameplay in 32, um, 32K of data was uh, it's quite impressive. So it was a space, space shoot em up trader game. Mm-hmm. You, you gradually go from uh, sort of various status up to the lead status of your, of your pilot. You'd be a pilot, so you'd eventually go through these stages to get up to the lead. Mm-hmm. A lot of time parallel. And where you grew up in UK because yes. of BBC? Oh, okay, B- 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 I thought okay, uh, natural. And Ar- Archimedes, I, n- I never heard about the computer. Was it some like BBC successor or what was it? I, I guess it was in some sense. I can't. I'm not precisely sure on the the history, the business history of it, but I believe it came out as a successor to the BBC. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, And then you started to code. And, and what I understood is um, they were listing in the magazines and they said, okay, there are even more games, so let's try that. But, and then what was your first program you wrote? Hmm. I think I wrote a, a painting application. Ah, okay. You no, know, when you could just draw lines and spray paint with cans and stuff like this and colors. So I, I wrote something like that. I But wrote... cans is already evolved, I, I would say. You know, to spray with as a line I did, I think. Yes. It's just, it's just, you know, if you have a pixel, you, you have a line. And drawing. So, so, yeah. so, you know, you gravitate towards filling and spray can painting and stuff like this and, and various shapes and, uh, and stuff like that. So you would just do it for fun. And then there was more like asteroid and it would gravitate towards asteroid games or physical simulation, just, just playing around with stuff like that. And then um, a Tetris game as well. Yeah. So that was later uh, on. And I was proud of that one because usually Tetris jumps in blocks. Mm-hmm. But you could make it smooth mm-hmm. if you wanted to. And I copied a game I saw on the Amiga, which I saw that someone hacked Tetris smooth, so I just emulated the Tetris game. So it's stuff like that. But Amiga was later, right? I would say. Um, Amiga was around the time of the Archimedes uh, to a certain extent as well. And how good was Archimedes? Was it like comparable to Amiga? Or I, I... I don't think the gra- I think the graphics on the Amiga were far superior. But the yeah. Archimedes was pretty good. Um, and it had a load of memory and a very great, very simplified instruction set at the time, the risk instruction set, which made it, made it accessible to me so that I could code these types of games. So it was, to me, it was a very powerful machine, sort of ahead of its time, but didn't have, I don't think, this same sort of graphics chip set that the uh, Amiga had, but it, I, I believe it could make up for it in terms of its just raw processing power at the time. Okay. Because I had that ZX Spectrum, and yes. uh, and uh, the question is, you know, what was the, you know, if you compare it with Archimedes, maybe Arch- Archimedes was a more powerful, right? Yeah, yeah, I think because Spectrum was sort of earlier in its time, if you like, mm-hmm. the Archimedes was, was, you know, it's the first ARM type chip, so it had the ARM instruction set on it. It was just limited, but I believe it's still the same as it is today, I guess. It's Crazy story. I will have to research it because I uh, never heard about Archimedes and armies. It's actually an interesting yeah, story. Yeah, very localized to the UK. So you had the M0, not M1, so M0 Apple computer, right? I, This I, was the grand grandfather, grand grand grandfather of the M1. I do not have an ARM Apple computer yet. I'm waiting. Once this laptop, this is an Apple laptop, but it's Intel. Once this one, this one dies, I'll probably gravitate towards ARM. Back to Archimedes. Yeah, that's right. It's got a legacy behind it. Yeah. That's fascinating, which probably makes my day job a little bit harder because I often do a lot of um, uh, sort of going down to the x86 level to make sure that spot spits out the right instruction set. So mm-hmm. that would be, good It'd be a unique experience to come back to that. So uh, you've wrote a painting uh, game. So what was the next or what you wanted to achieve? Because you no know, painting is maybe fun, but 
-hmm. you wanted to do something particular with computer or just you know just because usually what is your mission you know would you like to code i don't know star trek uh, uh, <laughs> device or i don't know star wars r2d2 intelligence or what was the idea i think it's just to explore and play and just see what's possible there was no real you know goal at the time it was just to fiddle with the thing and mm -hmm. just to explore it and see what's possible so what was the next fiddling project then hmm? Sorry? What was your next fiddling project then? Um, let's see. So, gosh. I think the fiddling projects were when, when I got to more um, advanced levels of physics and maths, I fiddle with simulation of the, of the physics. So you could, wow. you could write games like asteroids, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, where you're sort of spinning around like black holes and stuff like that, so you'd emulate the gravity and the mass and stuff like that. So you'd fiddle just to get a visual. The great thing about this was you get great visual feedback on your on your code. Mm -hmm. so, so you liked math? Yes, and you could and you could emulate that math pretty simply, and then you could emulate sort of asteroids games where you're sort of spinning, you know, you, or, or or sort of a gravity game. You were spinning around black holes or even um, just bouncing balls and stuff like that. So it was just fun mm -hmm. to sort of say, hey, I can I can apply this and get visual feedback from it. But there was no real aim except just for playing around and, and doing that. So it was just, so, just fun. What happened after Archimedes then? What happened? I had that for a long time. So okay. going into university, I had that. And then I encountered my first uh, Sun Microsystems computer, the Spark. So you started at Sun Microsystems, or you bought one? I, no, I went to university, mm -hmm. and they had a, a, a sort of set of Sun Microsystems Unix machines. Okay. Uh, but in the interim of going to university, I worked with my father, and I actually built a proper program that was used in production, which was to uh, emulate uh, um, on the Archimedes. Um, how should I say this? It used to be this... Um, protocol over the RS-232 port for graphics. So mm -hmm. a, a system would be running and you connect up the port and then it would send commands to render graphics. So mm -hmm. the, the Archimedes was used effectively as a dumb terminal to render graphics and then to send mouse clicks and keyboard presses back. So I oh. wrote an emulator because it was cheaper than buying the, um, buying the, 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 the sort of dumb terminal that you'd buy from the company. So you can mm -hmm. emulate this and just do a cheap Archimedes computer. And so I, I implemented that. And it was that it was eventually rendering the graphics for um, uh, a control system. So a process control system that would control, um, say, a big ammonia plant. Um, Interesting. And, control, and optimize the production of ammonia, or control and optimize the production of washing powder, or coffee, or something like this, big industrial plants. And this little computer would be connected up, rendering the, the sort of images, and then you could click back and change the process. So that, that sort of my gravitation from you know, messing around with graphics resulted in me developing that kind of thing. So that and this was your first serious program, right? Yes. I guess. Yes. Not really knowing what I was doing, in a sense. You know, you just write it, it would work, and then it's used in production before you know it. <laughs> this reminds me of one of my projects with Java, actually. And... Um, They, there was a power plant and uh, they had, um, you know, like uh, the network of cables they have to maintain mm -hmm. and they had to buy uh, specific, you know, displays and hardware. Mm -hmm. And we got the idea to do it in Java. So there was a Java applet and, and, or, or a Swing app, it doesn't matter. And, you know, the backend sent us the graphic atoms And we rendered this in an applet. So we are able to visualize the entire power plant in an applet, which was crazy. That's really cool. That, that's and then we could kill, you know, we could cl uh, click on the on the applet yeah. and it send the, the uh, so this was a complete remote control and it actually replaced the entire hardware device and it went in production. But the cool story was we had lots of fun. And uh, it was actually built by a student back then just for fun. They said it's impossible. And I said, we could do this. So I built yeah. a that's kind that's of a prototype and student just accomplished the entire job. And uh, and 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 what I liked it, it it works surprisingly well, you know, and 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 replace you know the entire proprietary hardware actually. That's exactly exactly the same use case, just a different sort of uh, focus. And mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing was in this control company, but uh, and excuse me, RST was serial port, right? Is yes. this or, okay? Over a serial port, not the internet. Okay. 
Um, okay. The interesting thing was you could not, um, in some cases, you, you'd render the graphics locally on, a, say, a, like a DEC Unix workstation mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Um, but you could process control remotely over the phone, over the phone, uh, mm -hmm. an industrial plant to optimize <laughs> it for for experimental purposes or to see if you, to iron out bugs. So we were, there were cases where you know, we would be in, say, um, the north of England, and then we'd be in the middle of the south of England. You could control a plant um, making cement or something like that just to test it out. So you could do that. that was, that's when, which year was it? It was uh, prior it's, to 2000, right? Uh, yes, this is like 19, 1988 or 87. So this is this is crazy. I mean, this is like you know, it is. It will be even challenging right now. This is like you know what, uh, but but back then you were uh, 20 years ahead. Yeah, you could do this because the um, sort of the the, uh, the sample rate was pretty slow. So yeah, but still, so like in control theory, you got to, if you if you, you have to sample at a, at, a, at a reasonable rate, otherwise it, it goes uh, out of control. But if you get your sample rates right for the for the thing you're trying to control, you can do it. So in this case, the sample rate was was slow enough that you could do it over these uh, over the phone line. Yeah, but you know, architecture is architecture. Whether the sample is uh, slow or not, if you we get you know Ethernet, we can increase the sample rate right. and it will be, work better. But it's the same system basically what we exactly. did with Java. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. It is. It is really cool. I mean, this little computer. Controlling little mind controlling this big industrial plant was fascinating. Was it your idea or your dad's? No, no, no. That's his company. So it was all his ideas. I was just implementing certain things that needed to be implemented. So. And uh, your father was happy with you with your work back then. Yes, he was. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Yeah. Notice he said, "No, the code is, but yeah, it works, but your code is not nicely yeah, not formatted." Not like you know, <laughs> you know, you're learning. You're learning, so you're thrown into um, writing socket code on, on, on Unix or something like that. You just you just get a book and you learn. Yeah, sure. So you never learned this before, or you're translating Fortran into C or C++ or something like this. Which programming language you used for the project back then? Uh, that was BBC Basic for the Archimedes um, remote terminal. In other cases, it would be C, mm -hmm. C++. And then you just translate Fortran code. And how you learn the basic and C just to know by oh, just experimenting? Yes, yeah. so experimenting in books. So there's no formal education in this at all. Okay, and then I assume you like the project and you say, okay, I would like to be, uh, had something with computers and you studied computer science or physics. Yeah, I did uh, actually something a little more unique, which was um, uh, cybernetics and computer science. Cybernetics is, it was really electrical engineering and computer science, So, but cybernetics. Um, had aspects of control theory, so mm -hmm. what my father did, but also aspects of machine learning and biological systems. So it was actually quite interesting combination of that plus uh, computer science as well. So it was quite quite a unique course at the time. So a little bit neural networks, I think, yeah. right? And yes. and the interesting part is actually the uh, entire you know AI stuff mm. is actually pretty old. So it what is. we learned, you know, thirty years ago is not that different. What what happens right now? That, that, that's right. Yes, I always wondered what um, something shifted in in the sort of way we um, execute AI and, and and the way it's architected, but fundamentally it's very yeah. similar. Um, but I think just now with the amounts of data and computing power and yeah. some architectural changes they did it really and then some there must be some mathematical advances as well I'm not aware of but mm -hmm. but fundamentally it is very much connecting these neurons together and and back propagating my uh, my impression of the entire AI right now is it is more brute force approach uh -huh. you know with uh, with raw power and with very simple ideas and uh and you know even 20 years ago the entire ai try you know to be more smart try you mm -hmm. know to classify and think about you know connections between nodes yeah. and right now we say okay just compute the probability with massive calculation and see what happens and 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 the scientists were really surprised how well it works actually right so it's an interesting approach actually it, it, it is I mean, it doesn't seem to be a lot of science to it there's a lot of sort of engineering and, and gut feeling as this this works better yeah. than that. No one quite knows why, which is worrisome in some ways. 
Yeah, yeah, the chat was in scientists, and it's like, okay, sometimes I apply this function and it works a little bit better. It's like, ask, so I don't know, but you know, it, it, it works better. So, okay, this is, I like it actually, right? So, without yeah. lots of known uh, AI knowledge, I could actually play with you know the function as well. That, that's right. Or you could say, well, we don't need 64 bit precision here, we can go down to 8 bit. And yeah, so many, <laughs> so many nodes in the system, it approximates out or something. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, We'll see where it goes and how it's applied. Yeah. Really and um, so you started um, Kubernetes, which, um, Cybernetics, so, which which uh, actually was also interesting for me because what I, what I was interested in is you know, the robots. I thought they were particularly smart. And then the, the computers came later. So, okay, robots, I would I really like to build a robot. And then someone told me, yeah, but you will need a computer. It's like, why that? You know, because robots are smart as well as a kid. And I say okay, yeah, because uh, the computer controls the robot. And I say okay, then I will. I would like to build robots. And then I thought I find out that you know, cybernetics is actually the the thing to do. But I don't know why. I find out later that actually software engineering is interesting enough. You know, so, okay, yes. this is if you just just do the software, this is the best part. And robots are a little bit annoying. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I, I I you know over time I learned more to the software side than the sort of hardware side in that respect. It was uh, easy to, to fix your mistakes. On the hardware side, it was much more costly. Right? And you had to plan it ahead. Yeah, and also you can do everything you like at home, right? With robots, you always need the machine somewhere. And the machine is yeah. big enough. You have you are abs- absolutely depending on someone who has the machine, right? So this is what... That's right. And you, you, could, you could emulate the hardware in software mm-hmm. and visualize it if you wanted to go that far, which often what we did in, in, in control theory was we'd build simulations simulation of the model and control the model all in software just to prove the point this was the how it's, how it's called digital twin right it was your first project yeah. also 20 years ahead so <laughs> <laughs> so to listeners now note so what we are speak about uh, talk about today java so we are already 20 years ahead right so if someone would like to see the future they would have to switch to java right <laughs> yes i think uh, <laughs> maybe i'm not sure <laughs> You know, I think um, a challenge when designing a, a, a platform like Java is, I think um, when Gosling did it, you know, he was he was ahead of his time for sure when he was doing mm-hmm. this, and he, he took all of the, you know, the constraints and problems he had with C and tried to overcome them with 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 bleeding head research, you know, with garbage collection and stuff like this, and to create a more safer language, and and it just took off when the internet took. off. Um, yeah, you know, it really you know caught that wave, and then it sort of went into a s- sort of stability point, and then I think um, you know when some was a bit more financial trouble, it was it was it was it was funded less until Oracle came along, and now it's it's really um, ramping up in terms of the amount of innovation and development we're putting into it. Yeah, no kidding. This is what I can tell you. No, great job by Oracle. I, I mean, what you are doing, you know, to all Oracle engineers. And contributors is crazy what happens on JVM. So yeah. for me, it's really fun. I just know watching what happens and enjoying the entire history. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah, after, it's, it is enough for me, you know. After two <laughs> years, I learned the newest stuff, and I am the king, right? <laughs> because I tell my clients, look, we have Java seventeen, and they really, yeah, they don't even know that yeah. Java twenty one is out. So this is uh, right. this is my yeah. trick, you know. Lots of vacations, and just you know, two <laughs> two two years to learn the new stuff, and everyone is still excited. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, the I guess. The, the, the innovation is we can drip feed the innovation faster through the release model, but if you look at it probably over time, if you take a two year sample, it may not there may not be any more in there than prior two years. It's just that we can we can drip feed it more uh, faster than than before, which is a great way to do it because waiting four years for a new release I think is is, is somewhat problematic. Um, and yeah, it, 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 you know uh, sometimes you have to do it that way, but now I think we've got a better mental model and better way process for us to... but java is too interesting we should still focus on you right now because otherwise we'll spend the entire time with java so <laughs> what happens during a cybernetic study you 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 program something interesting so you, you know like interesting software or just you know we're busy with studying um it was a lot of busy with study but it was also um at the time you know, these unix machines were new mm-hmm. for a lot of people so there was a lot of hacking going on Mm-hmm. just playing around with the software here. Again, I just play around 
with the Unix systems. Solaris, I guess, right? Solaris, um, yes, Solaris Unix on Spark. That's right. So we just play, and they're all networked as well. So you could you could play network games and stuff. This was unique at the time, and so we just play around and learn the systems. And then, of course, there was you know programming tasks that you have to do with your courses. How how was Sun perceived by the students? Was it like you know software company like Apple right now something you know unique or was just another company for you back then for me it was pretty unique I mm -hmm. you know it was one of the influences to go there based on playing around with all these um, okay all these Unix machines and, and it connected up so it was um, you know because you'd see the Sun logo there it'd be dominating in terms of it, it, its use I didn't really have much of a sense of the company at that time beyond just the, the hardware that they offered and the, the, the way to network it up. People, towards the end of my studies in the, the undergraduate year, the people started talking about this language called Java and playing around with it, but I didn't encounter it or play around with it. It was mostly C, C++. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it, you know, it's kind of one of these things, a brand and the, the connection to the machine sort of sticks around with you and my father was starting to use it in in his company from DEC and HP it sort of shifted a little bit to Sun Microsystems in that way as these, these, these companies at least DEC became sort of less less of a thing mm -hmm. some are still around um, the, the, the dominance of x86 and Linux hadn't happened yet you know the economics hadn't cycled around to that yet so it's still very much a, mm -hmm. a core thing and, and the myth around Unix and how it developed and, and all this was was there for people to learn and, and were interested in that. So you sort of right in there at the time, TCP IP connected up there. So it was you know just at the cusp of the internet. Mm -hmm. so, so so you liked so you were intrigued by the machines and you saw the Sun logo so okay Sun could be a great company, right? Because you That's always right. said yeah <laughs> Yeah. And, and what happened after your study? So, so I, I studied, uh, and then I, I studied um, did a PhD within the same uh, cybernetics okay. department in actually virtual reality. Huh. So with, with <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> yes. 30 was, years, actually, there before, there before your time again. There was a person who developed one of the first headsets there uh, with, with magnets to, to track and everything like that. It was pretty crude, you know, uh -huh. and... and and crude graphics, but we were developing, um, you know, 3D rendering and 3D worlds to connect up to these environments. So was VRML? Um, VRML was a thing towards the end of it. Okay. Uh, but it, it was definitely, you know, part of re research studies looking at that. Um, and the browser, utilizing it in the browser. But we had, um, we were leveraging some machines which had crude graphics. And then we got into, we got some SGI, silicon graphics. Wow. Machines, which the Octane. They had the, the hardware to render things really super fast. They look great. They're like an alien. I think it was yeah. like Octane, right? This was the Octane that, machines. That, that's right. They, they were fantastic machines. Again, another mm -hmm. example of a company going out of business as, 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 as commodity hardware like from NVIDIA comes into play in, in there. But they, there was no, nothing to compete with them at the time. Yeah. So we built built pretty environments and rendering using OpenGL uh, mm -hmm. language with them and connected them up into distributed worlds. Multiple universities connected up, sharing the same worlds. How good so was it? Was thing. it actually usable? So how good were the graphics? Or um, it was crude but usable in a sense. You could, um, I mean, it was you could generate. That, that was at the time just before then. That, that was when uh, Doom. Mm -hmm. Wolfenstein 3D came out. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember mm -hmm. it. And someone yeah. from Doom, and, and they worked out how to do efficient texture maps. And so you could create, and then Doom was connected up through the network, and so you could play. So you could generate reasonable texture mapped images and, and, and generate simulations. I mean, it was still crude in that, but you could, you could do this and sort of try and um, generate interactive worlds or simulations um, where you sometimes have to overcome the latency problems of the, um, of the, the distributed system you're in or, or deal with the mathematical problems of collision detection of shapes. But like how you could describe a room? You had to program everything? Or how do you know how to you, program the texture? So you would, someone would have to build the model 
of okay. the, the room and ingest it in. Okay. In there. So you, you, you'd have to build it up. It's just some be a little bit laborious in some respects. Or, or you'd okay. save the models out to some file or someone else who would load them in that someone else had written and so So there was like a standard load, a standard format and I, you I did Maya, Maya 3D, Maya 3D or software yeah, like I that? I can't or? remember what the formats were, whether they were ad hoc, like a text files that you just okay. loaded with the shapes and so forth like that. Um, it, it was more like pretty crude, actually. But it's yeah. always interesting how to provide content, you know, because if you have 3D engine, now what happens with the world? Someone will have to provide the world. If this That's is really... Correct. And if, if it's not easy, it will die because no one will contribute. Yeah. And if it's if it's easy way to do it, you could capture with whatever, then it will... Work, right? That's that's right. We weren't weren't too concerned about the economic viable aspects of it. It's just that the connecting up to connecting up multiple machines and sharing that space and what what that would mean in terms of either um, you know one way you could phrase it is distributed interactive simulation. So it wouldn't be just sort of virtual reality sort of headsets. It could just be on the screen, and so it could be interactions related to even military training or something like that, or, or mm-hmm. training. People who um, dock ships in harbors, or something, you know, or, or, or simulations of aeroplanes mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It, could, it, it could apply to that. Yeah, interesting PhD you had, uh, twenty years ahead. Yeah, well, uh, it was a fascinating time, and I still think you know the virtual reality with the um, headsets is still struggling to find a, an economic reality. Mm-hmm. Even with Apple trying to push it, it's just. It, it's just constrained in terms of the human ability to interact with the computer. So but Apple idea could could work because uh, if they you know with one with with the goggles you can uh, simulate multiple screens. Mm. It could be usable, you know, because uh, uh, you could have you know behind you some some displays. I don't know with Java code or Java doc, and uh, you know you, you can use the room to to spread the information in a logical way. So. Yeah, if it, work. Mm-hmm. yeah, if it if if it doesn't impede your um, sort of, it's like wearing very heavy glasses on your head. It's, yeah, you might get tired. If it can fit naturally and not be intrusive to you, and as I think, uh, and also makes it look natural in terms of it. Even if, like I'd love to throw a virtual piece of paper up there yeah. to read, and then it, when I move my head, it stays it stays there, and it, yeah. it looks natural. And that would be pretty cool if they just you know yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and eventually we may get there. Uh, but it's that's augmented reality. I think this total yeah. immersion has, has much lim- more limited. Uh, yeah, use- sure. Fun use but even, you know, the goggles, if they are heavy, you know, there's like, uh, how this called uh, tomato technique, right? Where you work, I don't yeah. know, 15 minutes, have three, three minutes break. So with uh, heavy yeah. goggles, it will <laughs> even encourage such a technique, you know. <laughs> so, okay. But interesting. So what happens after P- your PhD? I went to work for some microsystems. Ha! Huh. You applied? Yes. And it worked well. Oh yeah, they were they were starting up in Dublin, so they were huh. um, built starting up a new um, sort of uh, set of uh, development centers in Dublin, mm-hmm. and so that's when they, the the Celtic Tiger in Ireland was was really taking off, mm-hmm. and so I decided that it would be nice to move from the UK to Ireland to work for some microsystems because they built cool machines and they built cool software to run on those machines. Which year was it? In that which was in 1997. Ah, this is a Java JDK 1.1 that was already... That's correct, yeah. So I, I wasn't very, very aware of Java at that time. So it was uh, you know, very... I think even in some, Java was something that was just starting to take off at that mm-hmm. And what what you applied for to work at Sun Microsystems? It was actually to work on the, uh, the graphical user interface called CDE, the common ah. desktop environment at the time. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, you know, a little different from some of the stuff I'd work in, but it was still connected mm-hmm. with sort of the visual graphical aspect. So it was some layer on top of X11. But CDE looked nice. Uh, it was also available as emulation for Linux because it looks yes. really nice. I remember it was like a, 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 um, a, a kind of a taskbar in the lower area, right? Where you can right. switch between displays. And I really wanted to have it, but it was only available on commercial Linux systems. And I remember in one point of time, it was uh, available on Linux as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was a consortium of of, of various companies, I believe, mm-hmm. and they tried to create the same look and feel across um, mm-hmm. different PC 
pieces of hardware. Um, so it had a certain, yeah, it was, it was fun interacting yeah. with that. You've got to learn a bit more about how businesses operate, about you know, how this code base operates. And what you did exactly there? You, you implemented what, the graphics I or? Just maintain the graphical system. Okay. <laughs> that claim to fame was adding tooltips to it, which is not that big. <laughs> so, but, you know, it, it was various maintenance and sustaining. It was very junior engineering job and just okay. to the um, environment. So it sort of, I traded off um, leaning into my expertise and what I knew to going into a company I thought was vibrant and interesting to see what opportunities they were, they were out there. Mm -hmm. And then you switch jobs at Sun, or you you st stayed. At Spent a few years there. Then I moved into the uh, um, XML Technology Group huh. at, at Sun Microsystems. And Should we cut this out with the XML? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. No, I, 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 this is quite an exciting time in some ways. You know. Okay. Was, uh, of course, you know, XML was well. The hype curve of XML was really taking off, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of fun fun playing around with XML parses. Um, what you could do with it, and I was hacking around with um, trying to um, encode binary representations instead of a textual form to make it more efficient to to produce and parse. And so, what I remember back then, what I said uh, this. Um, so my my problem was you no. Know, um, I remember the evil book Java and XML from O'Reilly. This uh -huh. was like you know uh, it was announced at Java One, I think, two thousand or two thousand and one. Uh -huh. And then all my clients wanted to have XML, but they didn't yeah, use that prop, uh, properly. What, what they did, I remember one client, they stored in a, a relational, in, in, in database, XML. And I told them, if you already have, you know, the columns, this is the metadata. We have the type and the name. But they stored the XML tags within the column. And then, you know, and then I had to buy more hardware because, the, you That's know, right. the requirements for, yes. the, for the storage just exploded. And what happened then? Then binary you know, encoding XML happened. And I was like, look, That's you right. all wanted to have readable ASCII. Now you have the ASCII, and now you would like you know, to encode in readable ASCII, unreadable binary. You know, what, what's wrong with you? So this was uh, lots of fun, you know, back <laughs> yes, and forth. It was, I, was, I was in there guilty in some respects. I think it was overused and overhyped, um, definitely. People were even trying to do programming languages in it. It was just insane. Jelly, Project Jelly, you know. There was Maven 1, Maven 1, was based on XML, and uh, I think was made by Jason Van Zyl, I think. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and uh, and he apologized for it. It's like uh, this was a really, really, really bad idea, you no? Know, to, to to have um, exactly. It was. It's a great format for representing structured documents or structured data. But yeah. I think we just we just overhyped it. But it's still way better than YAML, I have to say. If oh, I. Absolutely. If I will, I have to you know to choose to to write configuration XML or YAML. I always go f with I, XML. I, I would I would lean towards that too. I find YAML, YAML particularly confusing. Yeah, at the beginning I couldn't write proper YAML. I had to do you know open shift in Kubernetes, and I just couldn't. And there were really strange errors, and I couldn't understand. Everyone says it is simple. I, I cannot manage you know to write this. Now it becomes better with Visual Studio Code because it gets syntax highlighting. But I never had any trouble to write proper XML. I have to say. I, at the beginning, I even wrote, you know, deployment descriptors in XML, and it also worked somehow. But with the YAML, it was uh, more problematic than, than XML descriptors in Java, old J2E days back then. Yeah, I, I guess if you know a little bit of Python and know how um, literal maps and lists are, maybe you're in a better spot. I'm, I'm not that um, uh, sort of uh, experienced in that area at all. Um, I think I think Jason got the maps, maps and lists, literals much better um, sort of nailed down than YAML. Okay. But I don't know why YAML took off and, and Jason didn't in, in that respect. Just ah, uh, I, uh, the the the, uh, the official story is because Jason doesn't have comments. But I have uh, to say I reviewed a, a lot of YAMLs, but there was never a comment. So I said, okay, <laughs> I'm like, if if this is true, I would expect you know that everyone comments like crazy in YAMLs. But um, it was I had to know a lot of reviews of. And there's almost no comments. Oh, it's, it's a mess. It's a yeah. Mess. Okay, this is, then I'm really glad that we share now this, uh, this opinion about, about YAML. Yeah. So, um, and uh, what, what you did, JAXP in Java, the JAX, uh, Java API for XML processing, right? This, you work on that, or stacks, or what? Um, I, I worked on implementations of those things and okay. helped out on those things. Um, and yes, I was in that 
Java space, and I was plugging in alternative implementations of XML and, and, and specifying it all out. Um, and then sort of worked with people who were defining the SOAP protocol at oh. that time. And, you know, getting involved in that in that side of things as well. Um, so that was that was interesting. You know why SOAP actually took off in most of enterprise projects? So uh, I, at least I saw in the, some companies. You know what was the reason? No. Um, before SOAP, we did RMI and Corba. That's right. Yeah. And it worked perfectly. So uh, the only problem was the firewall. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to, yeah. to communicate with the backend, you need, you need someone who opens, you know, the firewall ports. That's right. And in some companies, you know, it was mission impossible. You, you had to know to know someone who does that and you call and then something happened. And with XML RPC, it was a hacky way, but SOAP was like the more enterprisey way. Yes. So if you got SOAP, you, you, you could just communicate over port 80 and you can, yes. you know, hack the entire security infrastructure in the company because... You, you could tunnel the commands via HTTP server, more or less. That's and, right. uh, and this is why everyone did so back then, because uh, because the, you could actually hack the firewall, basically, right? That's correct. You could also multi-hop it, too, so you didn't have to worry about all these intermediaries or anything, because all, yeah. the, all the internet infrastructure was already built up for it. Yes, it's a path of least resistance, in a way. Yes, and yeah. so SOAP was actually, re- to me, reasonably designed. It was a sort of got all caught up with the sort of, uh, the, what did we call it, the Death Star kind of specs? WS. Yeah, WS uh, Star, right? Death Star. Fundamentally, mm-hmm. it was designed to be um, in simpatico maybe with the, 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 the web and what um, the RESTful types of services were. Because I remember that, I can't remember the name of the person who originally designed it or was leading it for Microsoft, but it was very much slim envelope around something just to give it enough metadata to reason about what this is and to be used um, with the HTTP verbs. But then it just all got HTTP posted. So we'd tunnel it all through and it all got yeah. opaque. You, you meet uh, the REST dissertation, right? There was some one person yes. who, this was a very famous one. Yeah, I forgot it actually. There's a very famous uh, person who created, uh, also who wrote a PhD about the REST how how REST should be used, HTTP, and no, how HTTP is properly used, and this is what how REST happened back then. Um, yeah, I forgot the person. So this is, but this was very famous. You know, in all conferences, everyone talk about exactly about this uh, PhD dissertation, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and 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 SOAP was the violation of the principle because there was just post, right? And uh, also interesting is. Uh, the the, the uh, SOAP, SOA, service oriented architectures, were based on XML schema. And uh, and everyone said it's type safe. And what I saw in projects, it was too type safe. So everyone worked with string arrays, right? So this was like, it was a, it was a disaster because I saw projects with, you know, XML schemas and WSDLs and the entire spec was like, you know, string array. This is very similar in some types, TypeScript projects. I see, you know, they just use uh, any. And they say, okay, this is type safe JavaScript. So not really. This is like you know, if we read generics with question mark everywhere, uh, is also not type safe, right? Yes, this is. Uh, it was the the person who 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 um, was the sort of inventor of REST was Roy Fielding. Yeah, exactly, Roy Fielding. Mm-hmm. And he was sort of design came up with this notion of an architectural style, which is sort of a meta level above the architecture, and these rules which enable. Um, scale and evolution of uh, uh, sort of evolution of things at a great scale which is what the web was and then the we tunneled rpc brittle rpc through this <laughs> to his i guess horror i i'm guessing if i attribute something to that uh, so it, it, it's if you're going to build at scale there's going to be constraints that you need to conform to to build at scale and so the, all the rest is is this architectural style that imposes constraints on you for the scale, but if you don't, you don't have to use it. And sometimes an RPC mechanism is totally fine. Yeah, absolutely. And and actually, what I did in projects, uh, we used JAX-RES, which you, which you yeah. know what it is, of course. And uh, you, um, you, what you could do, what we did, uh, we took like Java reflection and made it uh, RESTful. You know what you can do? You can have you know endpoint like methods. Yes. Give me all methods, and you get back all the methods. Then if you uh, post to a method the parameters, you can invoke the method. You know. For instance, right. 
and uh, and this worked actually well. So we had a RPC over REST yeah. for a reason because we said there is no added value to have a business back here. We can just directly invoke the methods. Actually, people did that with the, um, uh, the sort of DOM on browsers too. So you mm -hmm. have a representation of a DOM on the server. Yeah. And then it reflected on the browser side. And if you didn't want to, you could do a lot of the sort of rendering. This stuff. is what GSF, what GSF did the entire time, right? And IceFaces and all the projects, the IceFaces was was famous for that, that they had two trees and they synced the trees, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, XML, you liked uh, XML back then. Uh, interestingly, I had a uh, conversation with Brian Gertz, Gertz from, uh, from, no, Brian Gertz, um, sorry, uh, Brian Gus is from Sun Microsystem, of course, or from uh, from from Oracle. Your colleague, uh, your colleague exactly, um, Brian Benz, sorry, from Microsoft, and and he was a huge XML fanboy as well, and Java uh, guy as well. He works for Microsoft. Interesting, and um, so um, what? So you, you did the implementation of uh, of stacks, the streaming uh, was a streaming API for uh, for uh, XML processing, and and the JAXP. Yes, I was, did some of the. It was more some of the implementations of that and some of the more um, plugging in binary codings of that. But so there were mm -hmm. others who did the, the, those, those, those implementations mm -hmm. themselves. So I, I hacked around that space um, quite a lot. And what happened after this project? So you. Uh, so what happens after that was I got more involved on the networking side of this with the SOAPI side with the colleagues I was working with. And so we were looking at uh, trying to think about. So there's all this storm around RPC and RESTful, RESTful and stuff like this, and it got very, um, let's say, religious in certain respects. And I got in, I got involved in all that and, and said, well, we can lean into the RESTful side and mm -hmm. we can design APIs, still leveraging XML if you wanted to communicate that and leverage mm -hmm. the uh, specifications by the IETF around HTTP. Mm -hmm. and, and build APIs to leverage that in the way they were meant to be leveraged. Exactly. Or, or in a way that were better leveraged in that way. So that's how I got into that with um, working with a colleague called Mark Hadley, who was involved in the SOAP specifications and then involved in the, the Java specification request for building what is uh, we know as JAXRS now. How JAXRS started, actually? Was it like, uh, who initiated the project? I think some some initiated the project. Uh, so yes, initiated... I know, but who who uh, how it happened? You know, is some like some executive say we need that or or I, I don't know. I, at that time, it was probably below my pay grade. To okay, know exactly how that happened. But I think we had, as a, as a, as, uh, as in the enterprise Java group, they identified a need. Okay. To 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 um, as a space that this needs to be looked at, and I said, and they said, right, we need to resource this. So who wants to work on it? And so I go, me please. Can I work on this? And go, yes, we can work on this together. So it was it was quite a good time. Very, very creative time. Mm -hmm. I still you know see your uh Java.com comments on Jack's RS pack and uh, <laughs> as an author and from the from the spec, this is what why I know you. But yes. by the way, I, I, I've wrote a lot of Jack's RS code today, so it's still you know Absolutely up to date. So uh, right now I use Quarkus a lot. Back then I use uh, Glassfish, Payara, Whitefly, all service, but mm -hmm. always JAXRS was like a way to go. And I think it was one of the most popular and favorite specs. I never heard something bad about JAXRS, I have to say. There's almost no backlash, right? There was no criticism on JAXRS. It's one of the specs which was one of the enterprise specs without any criticism or not yeah, what I heard, right? Interesting. You say that, yeah, I think, um, I don't know if we developed it differently to the other ones in terms of how pragmatic we were. We also, I mean, we also had an existing spec we were working from and it, it, it sort of hit the right time period when this was taking off. And I think we did it, we did it right without being totally opinionated or arrogant in the way we were doing it. And so we created something that was, Get, got the job done and did it in a way that kind of got out of the way. Mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't, so I think there was <clears throat> one, we got lucky in terms of the timing and then we, we did a reasonable job in the design so that it, it, it made people productive. 
and it didn't wasn't perfect by any means, but it, it I think it allowed developers to be productive in what they needed to do. I mean, what you could do differently, right? I mean, you have a path, you have you know the get mm. post. I mean, the, there's almost impossible to improve it right now. Or what would you do something differently? Um, looking back on it, no, it was fairly minimal. <clears throat> yeah. I think what I, I think um, also another thing that we did was we we were very diligent in trying to build up a community around our mm -hmm. implementation and mm -hmm. getting feedback from users as we were designing the specification. We're getting feedback from people who were using the prototype in production, and, and that that helped us a lot to to to, mm -hmm. to refine it. So, but it. Fundamentally, there was not a lot to the API. I think where we added a lot more was to to the implementation, our implementation. We added a lot more features to it to make it sticky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the API was pretty pretty lightweight in that regard. I think what I would do more at the time was was do a better implementation and at the time leaning more into the um, uh, sort of a cleaner model so that you could describe your model programmatically rather than just through annotations because it was okay. very annotation based and the way you would build it, you would look at the annotations and build up a model from the annotations but that model wasn't a public api and it wasn't particularly very clean but in hindsight making that cleaner would have been more interesting so you could programmatically do the same things as you would do through the annotations which gives an extra facility mm -hmm. for people to be more expressive You're right. Uh, what what you yeah this is like architecture point of view. What what uh, what I understood is, uh, you would start with the model and the uh, annotation would be one way to feed the model, yes. but otherwise would be like a DSL like API. That's but exactly. the cool but the, the cool story would be if we would do this, um, Open API could be also more tightly integrated, right? Because this Open API could just you know uh, expose the model yes. as a documentation, for instance. That's right. Yeah. I think that's how they, you know, I, when I left the, um, the JAX OS space, um, others took over, and I think that's, that's what they did. They re-implemented in, in the version 2.0, JAX OS 2.0, and the, the, the people implemented, the engineers, who I knew were very good, they, they re-implemented the design, and, and I think they did it properly in that in the sort of layering that, in that mm -hmm. helped them. Uh, what I missed a bit, um, it was... Uh, uh, I'm not sure I would use it a lot, but I, I miss that. It's more conventional of a configuration. For instance, mm -hmm. um, if you say, uh, if you put a path annotation on, on a class without any value, just a no blank path, I would expect that the name of the class is taken as the path, for instance, yeah. right? Yeah. Or if you have a get on a method, that there would be a way that, uh, um, and you say get path and the method is hello, I would um, expect that you know the hello becomes the sub path on the, on the method. This would be more, more you know, um, aligned with the other specs, but it is also a bad idea because no one would like to have such a path. But if I look at my project, there are lots of cases where you know the name of the method are almost identical to the path. So That's there's, right. so there's like the duplication, right? So, yeah. Um, Convention over configuration. Yeah, it, it's you know, there's a, it's a good question. There's a, there's a sort of um, how much. How much extra writing is that causing the developer to um, cognitive overload on the developer? And, and so you, I don't think in that case it does a lot. Not um, at all. But yeah. what was you know what happened then? The yeah. developer names the method uh, say hello, you know, and the path hello. Yes. And I say okay, then let's go with both hello, but they don't do it because you see the application then, you know. Yes. If you would, if we use a convention of a configuration, we could say, okay, if if this is identical, just don't name it twice. But if there is no possibility to do it with a convention of a con configuration, they, the developers, now tend to choose different names, yes. not to to make obvious that there is an application. So I saw really variations now with getters and setters. So they have like field, I don't know, name, and they don't call it get name and set name, something different because. Uh, get ourselves less so so i would say for me convention of a configuration means if there is no no configuration for me it means um this is my choice to be identical and without convention of a configuration i have to duplicate the information 
which looks for the, from the outside like a bug, because you see, hey, why the annotation, the method are always, you know, called the same. Yeah, it, it's a compromise. I think when you have these conventions, there, there are additional rules that, that are required for tools that have to process this too. Yeah. And so they have to embed those rules in, but there's a, there is a cognitive overload for the developer in that respect, um, that they have to look at these two things. But the, the method name could be refactored by accident, and then you're changing your, your interface, and your network in ways that you might not have expected. Whereas you're right. Refactor the annotation that way. So there's trade-offs, I think, in, in yeah, Sure. But uh, this is, you know, the, the, this is the feature and also the downside of conventional configuration because if you have a Java records right now and we rename a field, it's not called field, it's called element, not segment. No, how do you call it? The component. Thing? Component, component. component in, 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 a, in a Java record and it is exposed via JSON, it happens the same, you know, the, and you, break, you break the uh, yes, outside interface. Right? Yes, it's yeah. part of the programming contract. So uh, I think in JAXRS we lent on this, you know, you have to be explicit in these things and try and try not do so much um, uh, con convention in, in, in this way. So I, I was a huge Java E and J2E uh, fanboy, still I, st still I am, and uh, and the other specs were more conventional and JAX was yeah. a little bit less conventional. So this was my criticism on the Java E that um, Sun saw of that J2E, the feature is modularization. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have a Java E monolith, you know, all these specs inside. And I don't care who does that, but uh, they are following, uh, uh, they are very opinionated. And this is one opinion for all specs from the user perspective. But everyone was excited about modularization and we have various specs and you no know, best of breed. Maybe some projects don't only will need JAXRS and not transactions. And I said, who cares if transactions, EJBs and JPA, everything is small. I pick everything. I don't care about one Mac overhead, you know, more like Ruby on Rails approach and not as picky. And um, yeah, and now, you know, with now with GraalVM and all such technologies uh, and tree shaking, we are, I would say we can optimize a lot without, you know, thinking too much about components right now, right? That's interesting. I think um, where you get advantages over uh, for modules is a very clear boundary of um, uh, responsibility sure. the between the two. And maybe from an API perspective, like you said, from a transaction, there's only, only one class or two classes, I can't remember. It's yeah. very small. It, maybe that's too granular. Um, but it, it may make sense from a JAXRS or a JDBC um, or a J JSF or something like that in the, the Java e world to have them as separate modules that and there may or may not be dependencies explicitly expressed. Between. Yeah, for you, because you were, you know, the component provider. For me as a user, I downloaded Whitefly, Glassfish or whatever and got everything That's anyway. Everything. Yeah, and, and, and they promoted one, you know, Whitefly started with, I think it was called the... Um, uh, micro, I forgot uh, the the not Wi-Fi Micro. They had a specific name for it, and um, something like that. yeah, and uh, and they say, okay, look, we can you know create a server on the fly for you just with JDBC and Jack Sorens. And like, who cares? Because every project has a unique snowflake. Then, if you have a support case, you can you have you know to define. I used you know this and this parts of 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 Whitefly, and I always use everything. It was fine. Yeah, interesting. Think, yeah, it's, it's that's an interesting thing. I think it depends on how slim down you want something to get for your purpose. Yeah, exactly. It's very exactly. possible to get make a very minimal server for, for yeah. whatever your reasons. If you wanted transactions and JDBC, pull them in. But I think there was these profiles, I believe, where you got pulled in multiple things based on use cases. But most people, like you say, would just download the Glassfish or the Wildfly. Yeah. And they just use it because it's all yeah. there. And now it's a similar, I do a lot of serverless. So now it really, if it's a little bit slower, we have to pay for it. So I'm more mm -hmm. cautious, but I'm, but I'm still, you know, measuring and always, sometimes there is no difference because uh, how big the library is, but uh, what's the difference? How many dependencies you have, they, they are, they are loaded then. Uh -huh. But um, why, why you stopped use, uh, doing JAXRS? You quit the spec. What you did then? This is interesting. Oh yeah. So I, I, I reached a point. So the JAXRS and the implementation jersey, and I reached a point, it, it was a reasonable success. And at a certain point you go, right, it's time to, it's time to hand it off to someone else, I think, yeah. in part. But also Oracle bought some, and I thought, things are changing. Uh, maybe I'll try something different for a little bit, mm -hmm. see what's out there. So I, I joined a startup called CloudBees. Ah, I didn't know that. With... Uh... 
with the uh, Hudson uh, inventor. Oh, sorry, Jenkins. Yes. Uh, Jenkins Kos Kozuki. Kosuke Okay. I had so, a podcast with him. It was a really great uh, episode. We had lots of fun. Yeah, he's, a, he's a really fun guy. He's, 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 a, he's a fantastic developer. And incredibly smart. Uh, yeah. At least this is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he is. So we occasionally go cycling together because he lives in the Bay Area. And, yeah, and greetings to him. Okay. And um, so and you did uh, CICD on steroids, I guess, right? On, on CloudBees. Um, yes, so <clears throat> it was a wholly different new experience working in the cloud environment and, 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 and managing these things in the cloud and getting experience um, building these building these systems in, in the cloud. So it was, a, it was a good time to work with Kosuke and others in the CloudBees team at that time. It was a very small company. So it was something, in, you know, going from a big company down to a, a smaller company and the way it works, you know, the dynamics is very different. And the, the, the computer architectures and software was very different to me, even though I'd worked in the sort of the things that people were building networks, I was never on the other side of it. So now I got on the other side of it. So that, that, was, that was interesting. CloudBeats was uh, fascinating back then because uh, it was like a secret project. Everyone talked, hey, there's a CloudBeats. And this was ne never, uh, no one knew actually what, what is it. And there was uh, what was known that you know some some Red Hat employees are quitting and creating CloudBees. So this was yes. the official statement, right? <laughs> Something like that, yes. Yes, Sasha and some other Red Hat employees. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so what happened after CloudBees? So so you were no more, you know, um, how long I, you stick with CloudBees? I went back to Oracle to work on the Java team. I got sort of uh, contacted. Uh, hey, would you? Actually, previously, before I decided to go to CloudBees, I was wondering whether I should go to the Java team. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was a conversation okay. going on, but I was decided, oh, I want to try this experience. But after a year, I decided, hey, I, I want to go back and try uh, the Java team thing because I want to, I sort of wanted to gravitate more back to some sort of deep, deep thinking around APIs and designs of platforms and stuff like that. Whereas naturally, at a, at a startup and a, and a cloud technology, you're not involved in those types of technologies. It's a very mm -hmm. different form of mm -hmm. development. So I wanted to go back to that kind of thinking. So I went back to Oracle, but into the Java team this time, not the Java EE side of things, but more into the lower down the stack. Yeah. As you, as you uh, right down into the Java side of things. So that, that was pretty exciting. And what what is your task there, or what was what what did I you originally do? came in to um, help work on Project Jigsaw, and help work on the uh, Streams API. Java Streams this is uh, incredible. So these Java Streams is the, one of the most popular uh, mm. libraries. It's still working. You are still working with Streams or and Jigsaw or um, no? Um, occasionally fix bugs or um, review comments, review. Fixes for those things. Um, there's some interesting stuff that's going to happen around that area and reviewing internally right now. I believe um, Victor Klang, who came from the, uh, the TypeSafe Scala team, has been working on some interesting stuff around that. I think he announced something on the lists called Gatherers, and he's working on that. And I'm looking at that, so that's stream related, but I'm, I'm not working on that right at the moment. Uh, very much working on something I announced recently. What I would like to do, reinvite you back and uh, talk about uh, Chicks a bit, yes. how streams are working internally, and then, if you like, about Babylon. This is okay. what, uh, because uh, this is uh, what I understood is the way, you know, how Java could communicate with GPUs, for instance, better. Yes. And uh, this is actually a huge story with machine learning. It's all about that. Mm -hmm. And the potential, from my perspective, is huge because... If we could, you know, do more native machine learning on Java, and Java is, you know, orders of magnitude more energy efficient than Python, mm. interesting stuff can happen, right? Because um, mm. we could write, you know, machine learning algorithms in native Java, which communicates uh, with uh, um, very efficiently with GPUs, for instance. And mm. I don't know whether they are aware there's this uh, a, a project called Tornado VM. They are, they are also doing interesting stuff in this area. And um, so um, I would say... This is what you said, you know, the inno innovation is crazy right now in Java area. I would say back then everyone was excited about, you know, annotations with Java 5 and Java 6. And now a lot more happened than back then, right? So, um, perfect. So, um, 
I would say I will invite you back and then just speak exclusively about Java. Sure. And um, I'm already happy though because now I understood a little bit more Jack's res. Where mm -hmm. we can find you on the internet and uh, you know uh, on Twitter or yeah. I um I stopped using Twitter. Okay. Because it's it's changed and I yeah don't like what's going on there. Yeah. So I um it's through the Open JDK community. Email. Open JDK community, so they can reach you if they have no questions uh, via Open JDK community mailing list, right? Yes, exactly. That's Perfect. Nice. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm really looking forward to uh, to hear right. about you know streams internally is always fun, uh, a little bit jigsaw, and of course Babylon. This is a great idea, I have to say. I just you know read uh, announcement, and I say okay, this is really interesting. What happens there? And code reflection, of course, which I That's guess is a part of the Babylon, right? That's exactly right. It's it's part of that uh, project. Yes. And listeners can, as preparation, already watch you know the J Java uh, JVM uh, language summit uh, videos. Exactly. They are yeah. they are already yeah. yeah they are already published on YouTube. There there's like a uh, ten or twenty uh, uh, talks already. So um, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic resource. There's lots of fun presentations there. Thank you. Okay. I will talk to you later.